Hello, everybody, and welcome to Pastoral Conversations here in Gordon Presbytery. I am with many of my friends, as you will see in front of you, and we have some new friends joining us today for a conversation that we are having on racism. And we, um, we see it very much in the news right now, and so I thought I would invite some friends um, so that we as a church do not remain silent on this subject. And so I want to thank each and every one of you for having a cuppa and a chat with me today on what is a serious topic. So thank you for that. And believe it or not, we are in a room full of ministers. So if you're intimidated, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but we are very real people. And hopefully we'll have some laughs even during this um, serious conversation. Um, so with that, I'd love for you to share your name where you are serving, and if you feel comfortable um, claiming um, what is um, your nationality, where are you from, um, and if you want to in terms of race, because that is a part of our stories. So I will throw it um, to you. Carl, would you like to get us going this, um, this today? Yeah, my name's Carl Irvin. I'm the minister of St. Andrew's Parish Church in Inverurie. I consider myself to be Scottish. I'm clearly white. I dread to say it, but I'm what we, what's known as a WASP, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, um, and I can't help that, um, but that's what I am. And we are glad that you're here. Thank you for being willing to be a part of this conversation. I'm going to um, give it to you, Neil, next, if you'd introduce yourself to us. Thank you, Heather. So my name is Neil Mayer. I'm the minister at Kintour uh, Parish Church, uh, also here in Aberdeenshire. And uh, I'm, I'm South African. I grew up um, as a white South African in parts of South Africa um, and only left South Africa in 2013. So the bulk of my growing up years and bulk of my adult life uh, spent in South Africa. Yeah, that's me. And Neil, we have invited your friend Boitamello to be with us today. And I'm so glad that you are here with us. And I would love if you would introduce yourself to Gordon Presbytery. Hi guys, my name is Bui Tumelo. Uh, I'm a minister at Trinity Congregation uh, Presbyterian in Grahamstown, South Africa. I'm very black. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm African and uh, yeah, I think that's capital C, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Boy DeMello, thank you for being here. Um, and Rona, would you introduce yourself to us? Certainly, Heather. I'm Rona Cathcart. I'm the minister at Inverary West Parish Church, uh, where I've been for about three and a half years. I am a dual national. I'm Canadian and Scottish, uh, born and brought up in Canada uh, of a Scottish family, but have now lived in Scotland longer than in Canada. Um, I have a, a treasured family story that I have a great grandmother who is Jewish. Um, we haven't really been able to find any proof of this, but I, I cling on to the hope that there is something a little bit more diverse in my, in my background, but otherwise it's, it's fairly firmly Scottish. I love it. And Rona, we're so glad you're here. And Rona has invited her friend, Akila, who some of you have met here in Gordon Presbytery. Would you introduce yourself to us? Hello, my name is Akila, and I am the minister at Fernhill and Capkin Church in Glasgow. I was born in Pakistan. I came to this country when I was two. I always tell people I was born in Pakistan, but I was made in Scotland. I'm well and truly Scottish. Um, my dad was the biggest fan of Scotland, um, and I love everything Scottish. Amen, amen. Um, Joshua, I'm gonna give it to you. Mm. Um, my name is Joshua Michelson. I'm a minister in Kimney Church in Aberdeenshire as well. Um, uh, also come from the United States and I suppose my family background is a mixture of Irish, English, and Norwegian. That's very good. And um, I'm married to that one and I too am American. That one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to Joshua. Um, so American living in Scotland, loving Scotland, um, and I do have um, I'm a fourth Scottish, so I can claim, um, that's why Joshua says I'm cheap, because <laughs> of my Scottish roots. Um, so thank you guys for being here today on a topic which sometimes the church has been silent on throughout church history, and I know I have been convicted as I have seen um, the riots again um, in America, and I've seen them throughout my life. Um, and there have been times when I have been quiet. 
And I feel as though it's a point where um, I don't feel comfortable being quiet, even though I recognize my skin is white, I am Caucasian. And so many of you from Gordon Presbytery also said, can we have this conversation? Could we start it? And I am gonna recognize that it is a conversation. We're not gonna hit on every topic today. Um, this may turn into multiple episodes, but it's a start. And the point is that this conversation continues in your homes, in your churches, um, and that if you're led, that you take it to where you feel led. Um, we're not here telling you how to vote, anything like that. We're telling you our experiences and our stories, or perhaps things that we have learned through our education and through the ministry. So thank you so much for being here, all of you. And so I thought I'd start with a story that I would get, a question that I would give to all of you. Um, and it could be a simple yes or no for this, or you could pull in a story. But do you believe that racism still exists? There are people out there um, who are saying it does not. It is not a part of our culture. Also, people are saying, wait, no, we live in a colorblind society. Um, I don't even see color. So you can enter into both of those um, if you want um, in terms of does racism exist? Um, do people see color in our society today? Or if you want to tackle it, you can pull in the white supremacy, which kind of comes into that. So huge topics um, to tackle. Um, Neil, if you're comfortable, I'm going to give it to you first. Neil, is racism an issue in our world here in Scotland? I'll give it to you, Neil. I don't think you see it so clearly here uh, as perhaps I, I saw it growing up in South Africa. But here's a thought I had about this about this question. That is that uh, I think if um, if every racist were to stop being racist tomorrow, if they were no, if there was not a single racist in the world, there would still be racism. And what I mean by that is that this is an institutional thing. It's deeply embedded in our history, our culture, and our institutions globally. Globally. Um, and so I, I think I, 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 the point I'm trying to make is I think you should you, you should distinguish between me being having feelings of racism or having racist opinions and the the long legacy which exists which permeates every part of our society and our world today economically socially culturally and so on yeah so bringing in systemic racism to that which is a real issue so akila i'm going to have you build off of what neil's brought up um yes i think racism is prevalent in society today you only have to look at what's happened in Glasgow at the weekend, and I think it was last night, um, to see that it, it is. Um, yesterday, it was some refugees that were um, peacefully demonstrating about what was um, their situation in Scotland at the moment, and uh, they were attacked by racist thugs. And then at the weekend, we had demonstrations. I think um, it was to do with the statues in, in Glasgow. And um, one of the, he was a, a photojournalist and um, it was racially, it was a racially motivated attack and there was a lot of it going on. I think it's, I think Facebook and the internet has given people the voice to make racist comments and then to do it openly as, as well now. Um, I would probably say um, when I when my mum and dad first came to this country, it was more, well, no, it wasn't actually more underlying. Um, you would see it like down in London, you would see um, adverts for renting places and they would say like, um, no Asians, coloreds, blacks, Irish. And when my mum and dad first went to buy a house in this country, um, people wouldn't sell to Asians. And it was my white aunt who had to go and look at the house on behalf of my parents. And that wasn't an uncommon incident. Um, it was reasonably common that um, that, would, that would happen. People wouldn't sell to Asians. Um, but I definitely think the internet has given people a voice. Um, whereas many years ago, you could kind of go under the radar as far as your racism is concerned. Yeah, I think we've definitely seen the danger um, of what the internet has done. I have had to stop reading some threads and on newspaper articles um, because I'm saddened by the state of our world as some of the things I've said and some things that Christians are saying. Um, Rona, I'm gonna give it to you to continue the conversation. 
Yeah, I, I'm picking up on, on what Neil was saying about the difference between feelings and institutional racism, I think is really important because it's very easy for people to say, oh, I treat people equally. I'm, I'm not that. Most people I meet are nice and all of the rest. But the, the harder thing often is to address what actually um, structures might be in place that if you are a person who is in the majority population and have never experienced the kind of disadvantages that those those structures can create you may well be blind to it and i think that's the kind of blindness that is more important than the so-called color blindness because people say oh i'm colorblind i don't notice the difference but you know i've certainly heard people of color say i don't want you to be colorblind i want you to recognize that I am in a different situation and that I have been disadvantaged um, by these institutions that you, you take for granted. You know, our perspective makes such a difference. I was um, hearing when, when I was in um, Israel and Palestine a couple of years ago, a, um, the minister at uh, the church in Tiberias talking about her experience in Gaza. And she was saying when she came back to her very kind of conservative uh, Jewish town, People couldn't understand how the helicopters that they felt safe, that made them feel safe if you were in Gaza, made you feel very threatened. And they just could not get their head around the fact that something that made them feel safe was threatening to somebody else. And I think we're all at risk of that sometimes, of not being able to or not being willing to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and see that the very thing that we think is keeping us safe is actually really pushing somebody else down. I agree. I agree with that, Rona. Carl wants to respond and then we'll go down to Joshua. Carl first. I agree with everything that's been said and um, I'm shocked by Attila's revelation about the uh, people not wanting to sell to our parents because they were Asian. Um, but yeah, I, I, when I was really wee, I lived in Singapore, so I was, I was very aware of all shades of colours. And But I did my secondary schooling in the northeast of Scotland it was a large secondary school, 1,500 people, and I can only recall ever seeing two non-white faces there, and they were the sons of the local Chinese takeaway owner. Against that background, you know, people, they just don't register. Feelings are governed by what they, what they see, and I think we all have to recognise that we can be we make prejudicial you know, judgments about people on, for, on their appearance, whether that be skin color or the clothes they're wearing or their level of ability or disability. And I think, yeah, yes, there's institutional problems. Um, yes, there are downright nasty racists, but we each need to look at ourselves. And whenever we find ourselves making a prejudicial judgment against someone, Based on whatever, we need to question ourselves and we need to be honest with ourselves and say, well, I'm not perfect either. And I, um, I make these prejudicial judgments, even though I hate myself from doing it. Yeah, it starts here. We have to look in. And so I think the first thing, if we do have to pause and ask ourselves, if our first thing is that we say we're not racist, we do need to examine and examine and go down the layers of, you know, how was it that our parents were able to get a house? Or are we standing upon um, a legacy that was easier for us and harder for others? Um, Joshua, we'll go with you and then Boitamelo. I'm going to jump over to you after Joshua. Joshua. Yeah, I would certainly. Um agree with everything that's been said so far. But I mostly want to pick up on, Rona, what you were you were saying about the helicopter imagery, about perception of safety versus perception of fear. I think that really, that perception really gets at the heart of what's happening in the United States. That's the context that I feel most comfortable talking about, I suppose, with the, the issue of police. You know, is that a lot of folk who are struggling to understand why the police are being um, criticized, demonized, you know, whatever. But it comes down, I think, to an issue of perception is that people who feel that way feel like the police are there to protect and to serve. And, you know, ideally that's maybe the case, but there are a lot of very legitimate reasons why people of color w could feel exactly the opposite about the police force, and especially in light of recent events happening of, of issues of brutality and, and murder and whatnot. But this goes back in America decades upon decades. You know, it's some people in the States like to pretend that things were solved after the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But all that really did was shift the issue away from maybe blatant discrimination like segregation and whatnot 
to this institutionalization of rules and regulations that make it borderline impossible for people of, of color and, and more minorities to get a fair shake. Thank you for that, Joshua. Boitamelo, you're listening in. Um, obviously, we're speaking here in the UK, but we would love your expertise mm. and your experience. <laughs> um, <Expertise. laughs> um, thank you. I, I have to, first of all, thank you for putting me this far in this conversation. Because initially, this question put me in two places. Firstly, it confused me. Uh, that we actually have to ask, does this exist? And secondly, I was also curious to find out how we're going to do this and how much theory is going to be in this. Because for me, um, as a black South African, this is not a question. Uh, this is a reality. And it's not only a reality for me in South Africa. I, I've had an opportunity to travel around in some countries. And I have found that as a black person, it doesn't matter where you go. The racism is there. And the racism is staring you blank in the face. You would be going with other people. And along the journey, you might think you are the same because you understand each other. You have a relationship with each other. But once you get to border posts, you get to institutions, you realize just how separate and how different you are. And the people you go with somehow are not even aware of what is happening. Because what we do is what we've just been talking about. We are I also have to acknowledge my background in as a South African, as an African, that we are usually communally thinking in, a, in our whole setup. And to go with people that when you get stopped and they just pass, they don't recognize that that is the hurting part because you realize that they are not seeing what you are seeing. And although you are traveling together, you are still not together. Whereas in my understanding, if I go with you, if something happens to you, I can't move, I can't go on. I have to stay behind so that we are able to journey together. So when this question came up, does racism exist? Um, anything and everything I say, blame Neil for that. Um, when this was asked, I asked myself, how do you even ask that question? Do we have to agree? for racism to exist. Is our saying yes, make it real or not? And the reason I'm saying blame Neil for this is that you will find that I'm not a very politically correct person. In fact, I hate political correctness uh, because I believe that political correctness is more concerned with how the things sound instead of what it is. Uh, so, honored and <laughs> surprised at the same time that racism is a question even, because I believe that even for it to be a question is a luxury. For example, we talk about, uh, uh, when we talk political correctness, uh, you, we, we have this, when we talk about other people, you know, it's a politically correct term that we is used particularly mainly by the Americans. You talk about people of color. And then I ask myself, who does not have color? Why is there a distinction that says people of color? The whole thing just makes the difference more entrenched. Uh, you can say that I am three-thirds Italian and four-thirds as French, nice combination, but color doesn't come into it unless it is a color that is not white. Immediately when it is not white, we talk about with color, we talk about ethnicity, we talk about all that. And this is a worldwide phenomenon that is happening all over the world. Um, 
South Africans have been open and honest and brutal about it. And I, I think this is why we take it for granted that it is so obvious you don't have to ask the question. But you asking the question also put me in a condition that it is not only through my eyes that the world looks. There are different ways, different specs that we look at the world at. And I personally would not make a distinction between the system and the individual because the system is made by the individual. The system is feeding and forming the individual. The system is, you know, the basis is just that distinction, for example, for me, you find a politically correct way. I think it's fake. Um, and I think it's part of us as human beings, as Christians, wanting to put a distance between us and what is happening. Like, for example, the question was talking about America and uh, the US. Um, sorry, America and US are the same thing. And, and the UK. But I understand also that you are trying to look at this from the context where you are in, where it is not a discussion or where it does not affect uh, people as life and America has given it a voice. Because for me, the question had not been, does it exist? The question had been mainly, why now? Mm. And where do we go yeah. from here? Yeah. I think in a long way, I'm African, so we take a long time to answer simple questions. <laughs> that is my point for it. Mm. Boy, Tamela, I am so glad that you are here today. And we started this um, conversation saying, um, Neil, you were going there, that sometimes that we, we don't think that we're racist, but we don't understand our privilege until you ask a question, um, which is a reality that many people live with. And so by just asking that question, um, you humbled us to remember that we stand upon privilege. Um, and so um, I loved that. That was very helpful for me. And one of the things that I um, am learning during this time um, is the posture of being a learner. And I, I think we were in a, a place of um, ministers, but we all have a place um, to learn. Um, Akila, would you keep the conversation going? Yeah. Can, can I? Give an experience. I remember when I was in London, I was on the tube in London, I was in my early 20s and I'd left Glasgow to um, go down to, it was Cornwall but I was in London at the time. I was my first time away from home and I was on this packed tube in London and there was this guy sitting opposite, he must be in his 40s or something and as we were sitting he was smiling at me. He got a pen out and then wrote, put a swastika on his palm and then just sat and smiled and put his hand up with the swastika on it. And I remember at the time, I was, I was actually embarrassed for me. And I don't know why, I felt, oh, ashamed. And now I... And I remember people round about me looking and you could see the disapproval, but nobody said anything. And I didn't have the words to answer back what, what was happening. And, you know, and I've thought about it a lot over the years. I think if I was the person I was today and somebody did that, I would definitely speak up. But I remember at the time feeling helpless and ashamed that it's, it's weird it's like ashamed being the color that you are you know um and it's and i think back and i think you know it's it's a terrible thing to think that you're ashamed of the skin that you're born in but there are times when things happen that it does make you feel that way it makes me feel why wasn't i born white and you know um Growing up on television, you never really saw black faces, Asian faces, anything other than white. And the only time that you did see them is was, was when it was a comedy and it was a send-up. But otherwise, you never saw that. And as a child, I always thought, why wasn't I 
born with, how come I was born a different colour? And I think it's taken a long, long time to grow into my skin. And I remember when I was 21 and I went, we took a family trip to India and Pakistan. That's where my family comes from. And at the time I thought, great, I'll fit in. Everybody will be the same color as me. But when I got there, I didn't fit in there either. And it's strange because you think, well, it took me a long time to figure out where do I fit in. I don't fit in there. I don't fit in here. But it took a long time to realize I am what I am. So I go with it and I don't make apologies for who I am. But that was a long time in the, in the process. Um, especially when everybody around you is a different color. And even though as a youngster, um, there was an Asian community, um, I went to school, I had white friends, I had very, very few Asian friends and still don't have many. In fact, you know, I remember once an Asian called me a coconut, which is brown on the outside, white on the inside. Um, I didn't really know what it meant at the time. I thought, oh, okay, I'm a coconut. Um, but I think, I don't know. I, it take, took me a long time to get used to my skin. Um, and it was a journey. It wasn't just one day I woke up and thought, hey, you know, I'm Asian and I'm proud of it. Um, I th think the thing for me was when we had the election for um, independence, and I remember it was Scottish Asians for independence, and I suddenly thought, you know what, I fit in. And that was really, so that was not long ago, but I thought, you know what, I'm a Scottish Asian and I'm proud of it. And that was when it really, something clicked. And that's my story. Sorry, it went on. No, you don't have to apologize at all, Akilia. We are here to listen and to learn from you. And we're so thankful that you share that story with you. And Boy Tamila wants to keep the conversation going. So we're going to give it over to her now. Okay, yeah. I also have to say that as a Black South African, I do acknowledge that there is a privilege that I have as being one who is amongst the majority in my own country, even with everything that is happening. Uh, and I am in a land that I can call my own. Mm -hmm. Whilst we have, for example, when you look at the American context, where mm -hmm. the black people are dispossessed in every single way that you can think about, in the fact that even when I do not fit in, in the system of uh, color, there is somewhere where I belong and that is entrenched and it helps me helps make me the person that I am. Uh, I have a tribe that I belong to. I have a clan that I belong to. So there is something that I can hold on to whilst others don't have the privilege. And sometimes even that can be taken for granted. Um, I, I like to joke and well, it's not a nice joke, but I do joke that uh, Caucasian people can say that I'm two thirds dead and one third dead and one third dead. But uh, for Africans, you are never half of anything. You are what your father eats. And this is one of the reasons why it becomes so entrenched because when your, uh, our fathers are the ones that are killed, it means our identity is killed, our identity is lost. When our fathers are the ones that are taken into forced migrant labor and they are not there, it means we miss out on that identity and on the family being built up. And this is where the system comes up. But the system is only able to succeed because of what it puts out there. The major thing that the system puts out there is fear. Fear, and when you fear that you will lose your privilege, you'll lose your money, status, whatever, and that is what makes you see the other as a threat. 
and as a possible somebody who can steal or take what belongs to you. And I think all of us, we have positions where we can say there is a privilege that we have and there is somewhere where we do not have a privilege. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Um, the system puts out fear. And as Christians, we are not to serve fear. And that is not to become our God. And so as we continue this conversation, I would love for us to also unfold um, our faith into this of what, what does God call us as Christians um, to do? Um, and for today's talk, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us there. But all of us will be back um, next week um, for another conversation. So please join us um, next week. So I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your creation, that you bring, um, you breathe life and that you brought forth Adam. And from that, so many more generations of diverse color. But with that, sin came into the garden. And with that sin came a division that we decided one is better than the other. And you cried and you lamented. And you stand before us today lamenting for the racism that exists in your world. And we ask in your name for reconciliation to come. We ask in your name that we would not submit to fear as our God, but we would submit to you, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. So Lord, thank you for the seeds that you have planted today. Would you continue to grow forth your kingdom in this world? And would you search our hearts so that we would not continue to live forth in sin, in communal sin, that our ears would not be plugged and that our, that our feet, our hands, would, and our mouths would not be serving you and stepping forward and taking a risk for our brother and sister in Christ who may be of a different color. Lord, would you use us, we pray. We pray this in your name as God's children together say, Amen. 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 So thank you guys um, for joining us for this first session on racism, and we'll be back next week for that. So bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. bye.